Um, Pat, welcome to the conference. Uh, I, I, I understand that the, the overall theme for you is a good data and Oracle story. And uh, who, who doesn't want to hear about good data? So uh, how are you? And uh, please properly introduce yourself. Spot on. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, nice to uh, nice to be here. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Uh, and uh, nice to hear from you too, Roland. I, uh, Roland's one of the few people in the Web3 space that I've actually met uh, in real life. COVID had, has made meeting impossible, but somehow I've, I've met uh, met Roland. Um, yeah. So, so Jeff, do I do I just go right into it? Uh, or, yeah. Go or, ahead. Um, the stage is yours. However, you like to do it. If you want to have a conversation, we could do so. But if you like to talk and present. It's it's um, you know it's all yours. Perfect. All right. Cool. So hi, how's it going, everybody? So um, I was having a little little trouble um, hearing when I was a listener. So I just posted a Twitter thread, or excuse me, I just posted a tweet um, saying question thread for the Blue Lava Twitter Space. Um, so if you go to my profile, it should be the most recent tweet that I, I put. Um, feel free to put any question. Like as I'm I'm giving the talk, or I'm going to do you know I have uh, 20 minutes to talk here, so I'll do 10 15 minutes of talking and then. Uh, answer some questions. So while I'm talking, if you have any questions really about anything blockchain wise, smart contracts, obviously Oracle and data related, feel free to put it in that uh, that tweet I sent. And uh, I'm kind of curious too, can we can we do like um, an emoji roll call? Who can hear me loud and clear? Can I, if, if you can hear me loud and clear, throw up that 100. Let's see, can people hear me loud and clear? Or if I'm if I'm a little fuzzy, put the uh, put the laugh emoji. <laughs> a little fuzzy to hear. Put put the laugh emoji. Is anyone listening? <laughs> Patrick, how do we how do we put an emoji into a Twitter space? Oh, so you can do something like this. Oh, okay. We have I see a one hundred from one of the listeners. So you hit the little heart button. Um, so I'm coming in loud and clear. Throw throw up another one hundred if I'm loud and clear. Put the laughing emoji if uh, if I'm not. Maybe just my phone. Maybe my phone. Oh oh, it's laughing emoji. So I might not be coming in loud and clear. Well, that's okay. kind of fun. Huh. But uh, well, some of us here you find it's it's a really odd today. How yeah, I was I was flipping back and forth between the speaker and a listener, and as a speaker, yeah. So I'm seeing a couple laughing emojis. I'm not coming in clear. As a speaker, we can hear each other fine, but as a listener, uh, it seems to be a little little bit tricky. But um, I guess uh, hope, hopefully it's all good, <laughs> and I'll I'll, uh, I'll just go ahead and continue on. But uh, yeah, I do have that that tweet that I put out, so feel free to ask any questions there. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, so data, good data and Oracle story, right? So that's the, uh, that's the title of, of my talk here. And, uh, when it comes to these blockchain applications and when it comes to smart contracts, these, these trust minimized agreements, that's really what they are, right? This blockchain is a solution to a problem that has existed. And I, and I always want us to focus on that. When it comes to these blockchains, all this whole Web3 thing, this whole industry that we're building, it's solving a problem. And the problem that it's solving is when somebody makes a promise to us, we have to pray and we have to trust them that they're going to fulfill their promise. And surprisingly enough, that's an issue that we can solve. We can build agreements where when somebody makes a promise, they have no choice but to fulfill that promise. And that's incredibly, incredibly powerful, right? And we've seen this happen time and time again where groups and institutions make promises and they don't fulfill them, right? Uh, I, a, a number of examples I usually give, I'll give like the, the McMillian scandal. So McDonald's made this promise, hey, do our Monopoly lottery game and you'll have a fair chance to win. Aha, and that was the issue there. You didn't have a fair chance to win. All the money went to the same you know, group of people for like 20 years. It was like $13 million, same group of people. They didn't fulfill their promise. You didn't have a fair chance. Another example is with what happened with Robinhood recently. Robinhood painted this picture. Hey, come use our platform. I promise you, I promise you that you will be able to engage in finance. You will be able to work with these financial markets. You'll be able to buy and sell stocks. I promise you'll be able to do that. And then what happened? They broke their promise, right? The AMC um, Game Stock stocks flew, you know, off the charts. And Game and Robinhood said, "Ah, wait, okay, you can't do that anymore. Sorry." And whether or not it was right for them to do that doesn't really matter, right? They made a promise they couldn't fulfill it. They had the centralized power to flip a switch and say, "Ah, you know, never mind. That promise that we made, it's not really good for us anymore, so we're not going to do it." Right? So they made this promise. They have this conflict of interest where they don't actually want to fulfill their promise, and that's an issue. 
So I always want to, I always make a point to go back to these first principles because this is why we're building this stuff. This is why we're doing this stuff because we are creating a world where we don't have to trust the other person's going to do the right thing. Instead, we move to a place, instead of having to trust these brand, with these brand-based guarantees, we have to trust the brand of Robinhood, trust the brand of McDonald's. We can trust the math. We can trust the cryptography. If a smart contract says one plus one equals two, it's always going to execute it like that. If a human being says one plus one equals two, they could mess up their math and say one plus one equals three. Human beings are error prone. <laughs> Centralized forces are error prone. So we can move to this system where a, a smart contract says, hey, if it rains, do X, it will always do that, right? Because it runs in a decentralized context and not a centralized context. And that's incredibly powerful. So these trust minimized agreements are incredibly powerful. Now, when it comes to these agreements, these smart contracts that we're building, what do we need with these? Well, we need a connection to the real world. Why do we need a connection to the real world? Well, think of any agreements in your life, any agreement at all, any agreement. And imagine, try to imagine that agreement without any real world data, okay? Let's, uh, your rent with your landlord, okay? You have, you have some real world data there. There's a, there's a house, there's a place that you're living in. Uh, electricity, your electricity bill. Again, your, the power, the meter that you're running, there's data there. Um, maybe, uh, maybe some type of, um, insurance, right? Uh, if it, you know, or farmer's insurance, right? If it rains, pay them out. Okay, there's data. Did it rain? Is it sunny? It did a tornado strike them, right? There, you have all this data you need to put into these smart contracts. Otherwise, what can you do? What can you do without data? Not a whole lot. <laughs> you can do tokens transfers, which is which is very cool, right? It's given rise to these these insane platforms like DeFi. You can make NFTs. You can kind of do this digital art thing. Um, but we can't we can't do these all these things that these this technology was built for these superior digital agreements they need this external data they need this real world data now if you go ahead and you do all this work right and you build this smart contract platform and it's decentralized and all the logic is decentralized and it's wonderful and you're very proud of yourself and you're very happy because you've now created one of these trust minimized agreements one of these decentralized smart contracts Awesome. Now, you go ahead and you introduce a centralized data point. Is your application, is your smart contract still decentralized? The answer here is a resounding no, because what have you reintroduced? By doing this, you are reintroducing a centralized power who, once again, has a switch they can flip and ruin the autonomy of your smart contract. Right? If they decide that they want to alter the data, if they want to turn off the data, if they're malicious, if they're you know self-interested, whatever, you've reintroduced this centralized power and you've essentially removed the entire purpose of what we're doing here in the first place. Which brings us to this idea of decentralized Oracle networks. So devices that bring data onto uh, on-chain from the real world or do any external computation, any type of computation that happens off-chain, are called oracles. And these are critical pieces of infrastructure for any smart uh, contract application, also known as hybrid smart contracts. Hybrid smart contracts was when they combine the, um, the cryptographic uh, security of an on-chain smart contract and external data. Now, how do we get this data though? It sounds like it's really important, right? We want the weather data. We want to know uh, you know, what's your electricity, how much electricity you use, where you're living or, you know, whatever, maybe not where you're living, but we want this data for these agreements, right? How do we get them to make these agreements that are these superior digital agreements? How do we get this data? Well, what we can do is do a, use a decentralized Oracle network. And this is where Chainlink comes into play. So we need a network where the same, in the same sense that your logic in your smart contract is decentralized, but your data is also decentralized. So both your logic and your data are decentralized. We, we need a service that can do that. And that's exactly what Chainlink is. Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network that can query data, that can read data. They can say, oh, the, the price of Ethereum is X. The, you know, the price of Agoric is X. Uh, it's raining outside. It's not raining outside. The temperature in Moscow is you know, X, Y, or Z. We have to have a decentralized network bringing this data on so we can have both 
our logic layer on chain decentralized and our data layer off chain decentralized. And additionally, not only data, but any type of external computation. Uh, as a lot of us know, when you make a transaction on chain, you have to pay some sort of gas, right? Maybe you're going to make some function call that is insanely expensive or needs to have certain permissions, or maybe it's some crazy AI algorithm that you developed um, that takes uh, your normal Linux CPU uh, a year to run, right? You're probably not gonna want to do that on chain because it's gonna break the bank. You're gonna run out of money <laughs> very quickly. So maybe you want to outsource that to an off-chain decentralized system and then pull it back in just as data after it's run, right? So it allows our agreements, it allows these smart contracts to go from these kind of fun token transfer things to these incredibly powerful applications that can completely re-landscape everything we know and love as far as agreements go today, right? Everything. Uh, and we've seen rise to this right now. Like most, if you look at uh, any of these um, these DeFi uh, trackers, like DeFi Pulse or DeFi Llama, you will normally see at least 50% of the top projects are using oracles as some critical infrastructure, right? And then another 30% are using protocols that use oracles. So, right, so we have an 80% of these top DeFi projects have oracles as critical infrastructure. And I think it makes a lot of sense because again, the oracles allow these smart contracts to do these amazing things and to do all the stuff that we really care about, right? Some of the biggest stuff right now is borrowing and lending, right? Uh, these borrowing and lending protocols uh, for doing DeFi, right? In order to price the collateral you put down to borrow and lend, what do you need? You need some real world data. You need the price of the underlying assets so you can measure how much collateral they actually have. And that's, incredibly powerful and um that's what chainlink has set up to do and that's where chainlink really shines chainlink is this decentralized oracle network that allows us to make these smart contracts really do anything really have limitless potential really be as feature rich as the web 2 space is with this decentralized context and right now some of these these out of the box really easy to plug in solutions for developers i mean chainlink price feeds uh, Chainlink Keepers, Chainlink, uh, Chainlink Price Feeds, which gets uh, the, the pricing of, uh, of different like cryptocurrency and stock assets, different financial assets. Chainlink VRF, which gives provably random numbers. And then Chainlink Keepers, which uh, does really any type of event-driven execution. So as, as we know, in order to trigger a transaction, somebody has to press the go button, somebody has to press confirm. Uh, keepers can actually do that in a decentralized context, which is incredibly powerful. And then of course, there's Chainlink Any API, which is this unlimited customization where you, if, if anything, uh, if any of those don't suit your fancy, you can customize the Chainlink node to really do whatever you want to do. Um, so that's kind of the basics of why oracles are so important. What we're doing here in the first place, and then some of the really, really powerful tools that developers are using right now um, to build a lot of these amazing applications, right? So there's applications like Aave, who's securing some like $20 billion right now, relies on these Chainlink price feeds um, to secure the underlies collateral, right? Protocols like Synthetics, same thing. Protocols like Compound, same thing. All these protocols securing billions and billions of dollars. I think it's, I think uh, the price feeds alone are securing something like $80 billion in DeFi right now, uh, which is an insane amount. Um, get, but these give rise to just more and more use cases. And we are really just at the tip of the iceberg um, with all the amazing things that are being built, uh, all the amazing, all the amazing places that, uh, we're going. So I have, I've yapped up a storm and let me, see. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yes. So, so Oracle that you are, um, are there designated oracles of truth or sources of truth already in Web3 so that if I wanted to know the sports score, the outcome of what the highest temperature of the day in the world was yesterday, if I wanted to know, you know, who's the, um, I don't know, the, uh, the, the top selling author of, 20, of the year 2020, um, are there recognized or, you know, sources of truth or vetted already that exist or when someone sets up you know, uses your technology, do we have to identify our own sources of truth? How does that, you know, do you have any guidance on that? Yeah, Jeff, that is a, that is a fantastic question. So 
similar to how you know Ethereum, Agoric, um, Bitcoin, all these blockchain works. Uh, all these blockchains work. The more nodes, the better, right? And what you're talking about is setting up a new decentralized Oracle network. So in kind of this Oracle space, you can have multiple networks uh, of Oracles that do different things. Maybe they get certain data, uh, they do different things. But at the end of the day, the more Oracles, the more nodes, right? And you can kind of use that, that term interchangeably, uh, the better. So right now for price feeds, um, there is a there is an established group uh, of node operators who are delivering uh, data in a decentralized context. So they're all independent node operators, uh, all getting pricing data. Now, where it gets interesting is kind of what you're talking about. You're saying, okay, well, what about weather data? What about sports data? What about this and that and the other thing? And this is where um, the customization of Chainlink really comes into play. Because if you wanted to spin up your own Oracle network, right, you and a bunch of buddies could get together. You could uh, connect to a few different sports APIs, start delivering that data on chain. Boom, now you have a sports uh, data feed. And actually, a couple of protocols are doing um, exactly that right now. The, uh, the interesting thing, especially with oracles that comes into play, is, okay, well, is that enough? Is, is it enough oracles? Is it enough data sources? Is it enough this? Is it enough that? Is it enough everything? And you're talking about, hey, is there a centralized uh, source of truth? So um, the centralized source of truth is going to come from the aggregation of multiple nodes, right? We don't want to rely on a single API or a, you know, a, a single centralized source because why? Because again, that's reintroducing right. the issue of centrality. So we want to uh, we want these nodes to be many nodes from many data sources uh, delivering this data. And right now, there's there's not an established uh, group doing um, doing price or excuse, doing sports data or um, or weather data. I'm sure they will come. Um, but yeah, right now, most of the use cases is with pricing of assets. Yeah, I, I having come from Wall Street and worked for a broker's broker, I appreciate the need for for for, for pricing data for sure. We were one of the sources that went out on Tellerate. Um, and, but is, are there business models built into the Oracle side too, so that people are being paid for access to the data, or is the data essentially free if you have access to the node? No, spot on. Amazing question. Yeah, so um, all these protocols um, that are using these, so we'll, we'll focus on just price feeds for now. So uh, whenever you request data, right, whenever you request data from uh, a decentralized Oracle network, uh, you have to pay, uh, I call it Oracle gas. Um, you pay okay. a little bit of a link token, right? And so literally kind of the same way you can think about of like, you know, uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or Agoric mining or validating um, uh, that little payment that goes to them for that. It's, it's the exact same thing uh, that goes to uh, data op uh, operators. And so that's the business model there. Oh, I love it. All right. Well, may, I may have found a new business to focus on. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm pretty much at time here. Um, but yeah, for, I have, for, this, I have for, for this conference, perhaps, but I'd uh, love to have you again and uh, I really enjoy your, the conversation. It's uh, fun. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, likewise, Jeff. Yeah, you asked, um, you asked really good questions, too. I would, I would love to, to come back and, uh, and have another chat. Uh, I mean, you, you have my, my info, so uh, more than happy to uh, continue the conversation.